Hello everyone and welcome to today's skill session on evaluation and monitoring. Um, before we begin our formal program, um, I'm thrilled to bring to the stage Camille McGirt, who's a CGIU student who's been asked to tell us a little bit about the work that she's taken on and the progress of her CGIU commitment to action. We've challenged Camille to summarize her work in just two short minutes, which I know is near impossible. And so I'd really like to encourage you all to seek her out after the session, share ideas, swap stories, because at the end of the day, that's what CGI is all about. So please join me in welcoming Camille McGirt of the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, who will talk to you about the progress of her commitment, Healthy Girls Save the World. Thanks so much for that introduction, Deanna. In the summer of 2011, inspired by First Lady Michelle Obama's Let's Move campaign, I established Healthy Girls Save the World. Healthy Girls Save the World promotes healthy lifestyles for girls ages 8 to 15 in North Carolina by providing them with free events where they get to learn about nutrition, engage in physical activity, and develop positive relationships with peers and teachers. Our pilot program at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill has grown incredibly quickly. I put together a team of eight students that help with event planning, communication with parents, social media, and program logistics. And we have a group of over 40 university students and athletes that serve volunteers as volunteers during our events. In just a little over one year, we've held 10 events, including a three-day summer camp where our girls got to hear from campus nutritionists and engage in physical activity with UNC's women's basketball, volleyball, soccer, and swim teams. Healthy Girls Save the World leverages the abundance of resources available on a college campus, like passionate volunteers, subject matter experts, facility resources, and athletes. This resourceful model makes it very easy to replicate the program, and we plan to do just that. We're currently developing a toolkit to help students across the country launch Healthy Girls Save the World at their own school. Specifically, this toolkit will include outreach strategies, activity guides, and teacher and parent surveys to measure at knowledge acquisition and, we, and so that we can attain measure results and outcomes for our program. I would love to stand here and talk to you about Healthy Girls Save the World all day, but I can't do that. So I would like for you to, to visit our website, healthygirlsstayweworld.org, and I would love for you to visit me after this session so we can talk more about Healthy Girls and so I can learn about, more about you and your commitments. Thank you. Today we'll be discussing specific steps and tools you all can incorporate into monitoring and evaluating your CGIU commitments to action. We'll begin with a conversation between Liza and Dick, and later we'll open it up to questions. Take it away. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to be meeting all of you here today. Um, it's been a really amazing experience so far this morning. I came here not knowing a lot about CGIU, and I've been so inspired by all of you students the speakers, the panelists, as well as, of course, former President Bill Clinton. Um, what we're gonna do here today is talk a little bit about monitoring and evaluation. And monitoring and evaluation is just a collection of data that determines whether or not your programs are working, and then helps you calculate their social impact. So what we've got here um, are a couple of examples from an organization that was funded by Echoing Green, my employer, in 2006. The One Acre Fund works with farmers in East Africa, and they do a really great job of monitoring evaluation. I encourage you to check out the One Acre Fund's website because they do such a great job of communicating it in both a very data-driven way, but also in a way that's really easy to understand by people who aren't necessarily familiar with their work. So, an example of a data point. The One Acre Fund worked with 137,000 East African farmers in 2012 across 23 districts. So the data is just raw facts. It doesn't tell you a story, it doesn't tell you a whole lot about what Andrew and his teams are doing or all their amazing work. But next up, we've got information. And as soon as you start collecting data, when you start working on your programs, you're gonna start looking for information. And information is data that has been reviewed analyzed and processed. 
So for Andrew, based on 1,250 surveys of farmers, participants in one acres programs see a 100% or greater gain in profitability after their first harvest. That tells you a story. It tells you a lot more about what Andrew and his teams are doing. And to get there, they had to design surveys, collect data, analyze it, and distill it down just into a few pieces of information that they can use to tell the story of their work and their impact. So when you have data plus information plus experience, you get knowledge. And knowledge is something that takes a long time to attain. When you're working in your program area or with your populations, it's going to take you a long time to get to that point. But with transparency and partnering with other organizations, your work is going to contribute to a large body of knowledge on these subjects. And that is what, you know, what you're working towards when you make those commitments, is you're working towards increasing the body of knowledge in the social change work. So now that you have known what knowledge is and you have a commitment that you're committed to, the question is, well, how do you decide what to track? And there are really simple ways to figure this out, right? We don't want to invent the wheel. Uh, people have done things over and over again. So the key question to ask yourself is, what are similar organizations tracking? If you are working with sustainable fish farming, what are other organizations doing the same work doing? So go out on their website, search, see what they have already, and start using those metrics because you don't have to redo or rethink things that have already been done. Uh, the next question to ask yourself is, what are people asking you, right? When you tell people about your passionate uh, commitment and all that, what do they ask you? I know if you're working again with something to do with education, people asking you, how, how many people are you affected, right? So keep track of those questions. Let those family members who ask you a thousand questions actually be helpful. Um, if you have friends that are critics, you know, keep their questions on the side. And when you're tracking, uh, or deciding what to track, use that information. And you probably have donors or people who you want to convince to give you money. So you can use their questions as well to help you decide what to track. The other thing is, what do you have already? You are probably working in a, a community that already has information written about it. So do your search. Google is amazing. You can find anything. Um, and in this case, it's no different. You can find out what information that you can already get from there. I, when we were beginning our project, Vice was Against Poverty, we used to ask people, how long do you walk to get water? But we realized that people have different perceptions of distances, so we would just go in their communities now and see how far the, the water collection centers are. And we don't have to ask that question anymore, always time like that. And there's a good metric uh, on the next uh, page that kind of shows you uh, what organizations track and uh, you know especially this kind of organization so look at that kind of information that has already been provided out there and use it so to continue with that last slide actually um, we're going to talk a little bit about monitoring so uh, that was obviously part of the title of this talk um, and monitoring is how you know things are working, not just when you're done, but during the course of your programs. So in this example, the overall goal of this organization is to increase student reading scores. That's our big goal. And that would be, for instance, maybe your commitment. You've committed to raising student reading scores in a particular community over a particular period of time. And what we've done below that is set three priorities. And those priorities were scale, impact, and sustainability. So those priorities then lead us to, OK, how do we measure whether or not we are scaling? How do we measure our impact? And how do we measure whether or not we've made our program sustainable over time? So this program obviously has historic data. You might be starting from scratch. But like Muyami said, what data can you get? Maybe these scores student reading scores from last month or last year, maybe you can get those from the teachers. And so you have a benchmark. You have that benchmark, you start your program, and you start collecting data against these points. And what you want to do when you're doing that is 
have your measures be what's called SMART. And SMART is an acronym that stands for Specific, Measurable, Attainable, Relevant, and Time-bound. Specific, just meaning they're very clear. Measurable, meaning you can actually get the data you need to measure that point. Attainable, meaning they're not so far out there. You're never going to get all the students to 100% perfection. Make it attainable measure. They're relevant. All these measures are relevant to our overall goal of increasing student test scores, and they're time-bound. That's a really important one that people often forget. They commit to raising student test scores, but they don't give themselves a specific thing where they're saying, okay, we're gonna try to raise them by five points over the course of two school years. So you wanna give your measures time commitments so that you can sort of track your progress over time and see where things are maybe falling off or maybe whether you're surpassing your metric. Um, and then just overall, one of the things that Andrew's organization does, and that's kind of what I base this off of, is his model of a dashboard, is this red, green, yellow system where you know over time you're seeing where things are on track, off track, or somewhere in the middle. And we'll talk a little bit about more about how to actually implement that in Excel later on, um, but for now we'll let you know, we talk about it. So now that you are smart, right, you have your smart goals all set, uh, the question is how do you collect data to help you show people that you are smart? Uh, one way to do that is obviously to use questionnaires. I'm sure you filled out plenty of this in your school days, right? People want to know all kinds of things about you. Um, and then you have transect walks, which are also walking through communities and observing, right? But you have to watch out. Don't be creepy walking through communities. And we know you want the information, but it's important to also consider what people, um, hope, how people are going to view you. Uh, you can brainstorm about things and collect information that way. Uh, you can have field discussion groups, which are also useful for uh, different kinds of information. And I think the key things to ask yourself is, when is each of these appropriate and what kind of information are you looking for, right? So, you know, if you want numbers, you probably want to go with questionnaires versus walking through communities. Um, and you can also mix the approaches, so don't worry that you have to stick to specific ones. You can mix them up so you can get better data um, for your project. And worry about pressure, um, peer pressure, right? If you have discussion groups, you know, what kind of hierarchies are people, what kind of hierarchies of people are you putting together, right? Because if you have a leader and his followers in a community together, they might be skeptical to provide you some opinion, so you might, you know, watch out for that. And be concerned about what the community offers. Uh, you know, don't take everything. If you get one information from one person, make sure you verify it in different ways. And um, again, the different kind of measures you choose depends on the kind of project you have. You know, if it's all about education, um, you're probably going to go with a different kind of data method um, than someone who wants numbers that show a certain progression in a community. So we're going to do some do's and don'ts for data collection. And these, some of these are specific to when you're doing interviews or those kinds of things, but it's relevant across all pieces of data collection. And the first is that semantics matters. If you're designing a survey or you're designing an interview, you want to make sure you explain everything. Define all of your terms. So in this example, how many times per week do you spend 30 minutes or more exercising? may include walking, running, biking, or other forms of activity. Notice how the question is very specific. It gives a time, and then it explains what we mean by exercising, because that means different things to different people in different communities, particularly when there's language barriers as well. And so the don't here is just don't be vague <laughs> in designing your questions. The other really key issue is be sensitive, right? If you're going to a community, you have to know the community from A to Z. Um, make sure that if you're carrying out a certain specific uh, method of interviewing people that you are conscious of their, of how sensitive the community is. So you don't want to have, to interview members really close to each other, right? Because you're giving out information 
that another person behind might be listening. And it also depends on the project you have because if you're selecting people for a certain um, asset that you have, people might start thinking of ways to beat your system, of ways to beat um, the program that you have in place, right? So they can come up with smart answers so that you give them what they need. And most of the communities don't underestimate the communities you're working with. They might go thinking, okay, you know, we have our program, it's solid, we have a method to, be, you know, to implement things, but don't overlook um, certain small things that might actually turn out to be really important. And don't make information, uh, sorry, assumptions about the community because first of all, that's very disrespectful and you, know, you wouldn't want the, uh, assumptions made about you. So don't do that to any uh, population. Make sure you have someone from that population uh, when you're working uh, because they probably provide you insights that you would otherwise not have. And you also want to differentiate. There might be things that are better asked for the other person to write down rather than them telling you. Uh, and you have to have someone from that community to understand that kind of dynamics in the community. So next we're going to talk about privacy. Um, it's particularly important with sensitive data and in communities that um, might have sensitive issues, things like immigration status, um, sexual preference in a place where that's maybe not accepted outside of the traditional norms. Um, and we just want to make sure you're always asking for permission. Mayambi has a great example that maybe he can tell you about photography. Yeah, uh, so we were working with a community in Uganda and one of our members just randomly takes out a camera and starts snapping pictures. And one of the guys raises up and says, excuse me, I didn't ask you, you didn't ask for permission. And right, if I just stood up and started taking pictures of you guys, you'd probably be excited, right? <laughs> so it's different. So again, don't make assumptions. Just because you're excited about people taking pictures of you doesn't mean other communities want you to take pictures of them all the time. And it also relies, my friend was making an assumption based on what they've seen on the internet, right? Pictures of kids from developing countries and, you know, probably happy kids and things like that. So thinking they can just take pictures all the time. So make sure you, you have waivers when they are important. Make sure you ask permission when it's necessary, which is almost all the time. And again, no assumptions, right? Make, that should be drilled into your head because it's important. And then our last do and don't is about documenting your process. So you're gonna be doing data collection and you might do one round now and one round next semester or next summer or next year or two years from now. You wanna make sure that you've got really clear notes on how, when, why, where, by whom, all of those things about what, how your data was collected because you wanna be able to correlate one round to the next round and you wanna make sure you've done it in the same way so that there's no questions about you know, someone's perception of a survey question based on the time of year you asked it or the time of day, or who asked it. So, our next part is about tools. Um, we don't have time today to go over all the myriad of tools that are available to you for data collection, analysis, and communication, but uh, Mia has promised me that after the conference we'll be able to have some resources available to you guys with links and uh, summaries on when you might use these kinds of tools. This is a sampling. Our next part, um, is an Excel for Analysis crash course. So, show of hands, how many of you in this room consider yourselves Excel experts? No, oh, that's, that's, that's Okay, for the rest of you, uh, you might not be an expert, maybe you've used it before, but maybe you used it to keep a list or to, you know, um, keep phone numbers or, you know, other ways of just collecting data, but maybe you haven't used it to analyze or do much more with. So, um, let me stand up for this part. The first thing we're going to talk about is setting up a well-organized spreadsheet. So, first thing, do please, when you're collecting data, use Excel. Um, I've seen folks put data into Word, into their phone, uh, into notepad documents. Um, it's not going to be that useful to you later on unless you put it in a place where you have the tools to analyze it. Um, name all your columns and tabs. Excel is set up in worksheets. And each one of those worksheets can, let's say, collect a different 
part of your data. So one tab on students, one tab on teachers, one tab on the schools. There are ways to combine all that later on, but if you clearly name all of your columns, all of your tabs, all of your rows, when you go back in to analyze it later, and let's say create charts, a lot of your work is already going to be done for you. Um, you want to learn and use formulas. Uh, when we get to the next slide, you're going to see some of my personal favorites uh, and when you might want to use them. Um, but it's something that's worthwhile and it's really going to change your relationship with your data if you're able to do some basic formula analysis in Excel. And then last, please make backup copies of your data. Uh, we met some, those of us who are experts, I'm sure, have had the experience where you do a bad sort <laughs> or some other kind of transformation that makes your data dirty and less useful to you. So every time you're adding new data to your spreadsheet or doing a new analysis, go ahead and do yourself a favor and save a new copy under a new name with the date so that you can go back to it later if anything should happen. A couple of don'ts, um, just about formatting. Merging and colors are uh, tricky later on. They can cause you problems, so it might make things look pretty but not super useful later on. Um, and like I said, don't try to put everything on one tab. There are ways to combine data later. So these are my five favorite formulas. Again, no time to go over them all today, um, but in the slides after the conference, we've got the formula, what it does, and when to use it in examples. So definitely take a look at this. Um, they're really simple to learn, and they really will change your relationship. Conditional formatting is a grossly underused tool. It's this button here in Excel, and it's in all versions after 2010. And what it can do is what we talked about on that monitoring dashboard from earlier, where we had the red, yellow, green, like kind of stoplight system for how things were going. In this example, we've got student test scores every month. And using conditional formatting, all we've done is said, okay, if the score is in line with where we're looking to go, it's going to be green. If it's not, it's going to be red. If you're doing this on an ongoing basis with your data, especially when you've got multiple participants or multiple, let's say, sites of your program, you can really quickly and easily visually see where something is falling behind. And you can push extra resources towards that child or that site um, and really, you know, redefine how you are spreading resources. <coughs> and then our last bit is quick charts. Uh, the first time you make a chart or a graph in Excel can be a little tricky, but there are nice tools online to help you learn it. And if you're organizing your data in a good way from the beginning, um, half the work is going to be done for you about labeling and putting, you know, beautiful things together so that you can, you know, report out on your data to your funders and your supporters. So you've seen um, Excel, obviously it's one of the, uh, the data analysis softwares out there. There's plenty of them as you can see on the list, so it really depends on how much you want to get complicated. Um, but yeah, moving on onto the analysis techniques that uh, you might want to consider when you know uh, doing some data analysis is, are you working with qualitative or quantitative data, right? So you want to eliminate outliers in um, any data that involves numbers, right? So just because someone says they make $10,000 uh, doesn't mean it's useful to you or whether it's applicable or whether it matches what you're looking for. So make sure you take care of that information. And sometimes it requires you having someone from that community to be able to make that kind of judgment. Um, you also want to make sure you categorize uh, any kind of data you have, right? So if it's about numbers or if it's about words, make sure you do that. And there is no qualitative or quantitative. One is not more important than the other. As someone said, not everything that counts can be counted, right? So sometimes you have to tell stories to your donors. Sometimes you have to give them numbers. But a mix of both, I think, is what makes the difference. Um, the other is, uh, going further is if you're working with a microfinance project, right? What kind of questions are people asking you so you can decide on how to analyze your data? Do people want to know repayment rates, uh, trends that are happening, interest rates, or anything like that? So those are really easy things that you're going to be able to use Excel to do, right? 
but if you're working with an education project and you are talking about how people's income is changing as a result of you giving them education or how is that changing over time, is it decreasing poverty or not? Now you're really getting complicated and you're really going to need to get someone who probably can use SPSS or something like that or starter. Um, and so the key is to realize it's not you have, it's not is that you don't have to do everything. You can find people with skills to help you do those things. And I think that's what um, designing a successful project is all about. The other really important thing is, is your data reliable and is it credible? For critics like me, you know, I like to ask questions whether you're really sure about what you're doing. I will always be asking about what your numbers are showing. And so, you know, if you ever want someone to do that for your project, you know who to go to. Um, so make sure you, you, your data is reliable, right? Because there's someone who's going to have the tough question that you have not thought about. And so reach out to professors, to people who have done this kind of analysis before and make sure that you are on point when you're presenting data. Okay, communicating information. Uh, the goal, like we talked about in the beginning, is to tell a story. Yes, we might pick at your data and see if it's credible, um, but what a lot of people are interested in is the story that your data tells. So it's really important that you, A, please report back to CGIU. Um, I understand that uh, really hard numbers and, and that kind of stuff is not necessarily required in your CGIU reports, but I encourage you to do so because it contributes to the body of knowledge that CGIU is collecting about all the commitments that the students over the years have done. The next thing I really want you to think about is communicating back to your stakeholders, um, your funders and your supporters. Please tell them how things are going. Tell them how you're using their money or their resources. Your volunteers really need to know. And then finally, program participants. Um, this picture here is Echoing Green reporting out and when we got to 400,000 followers. Um, but find a way to communicate what you've learned back to them so that they can then feel proud of the work that you've done um, and also be more willing to help you in the future. And I think we're wrapping up there. Um, we only had a little bit about uh, an M&E report, but you can ask me about that after the session. Great, thank you so much. And um, some of those points that are still outstanding, I hope we can get to in our question and answer session. So what we're planning on doing now is if you all can turn around in your seats and form groups of about four or five, and take this opportunity to really discuss um, the challenges that you all have faced, the strategies that you're using, um, and the um, ways that you're incorporating evaluation and monitoring in your own CGIU commitments to action. And so I know that um, Muyambi and Liza will be uh, kind of circulating the room and um, dropping in our conversations. We'll have about 10 minutes of this. Um, and our hope is after that time, we can uh, gather again and you can send representatives from uh, your groups and ask questions to our panelists. And at that time, um, we'll be running around the microphone um, and communicating with you all. Um, because we do have a little bit of a time constraint and we want to be sure that you all get back to our closing plenary um, on time, I ask that you, of course, introduce yourselves, but um, keep it brief so we can really deeply delve into the meat of um, this issue, which is the evaluation plenary piece. Anyway, go ahead, enjoy. Uh, actually, <laughs> we just uh, talked a little bit about this, right? We didn't talk about this in the um, in the slides, but you can code your data um, to certain things, right? So um, I don't remember what you mentioned, but how many people in your group are feeling empowered by by the project? How how many are feeling good about it? So you can kind of um, kind of quantify those responses to actually give you numbers. So, and I think it's doable. And you know, you can reach out to us more in detail, but I think that's the quick question and answer I can give. Does survey design is a whole field. Like there's, the, there's a whole field of, um, and we talked a little bit about semantics and that kind of thing. Um, so forming questions that get at the data you want and to, like Naomi said, to be able to 
sort of metricize those um, is something that I've been looking a lot into lately. Please feel free to reach out to me. Um, I've been designing some surveys for Echoing Brain in which we're thinking about those same things about how they feel about participating in our evaluation of fellowship applications. So that's not something that's really easy to, to quantify, but um, we're able to do it in a couple of different ways. So please feel free to reach out. Um, so I work with an educational outreach program, and some of our programs involve actual um, application processes. So we have a large population of 100 people that actually send us applications, but we can only admit you know, 15 or 16. So a lot of the impacts we're measuring, uh, it's really difficult for us because we're only able to measure impacts on the population that we accept. So we really have no comparison. There's no good control. And I was curious how maybe in, in similar fields or this field, uh, people get around that. How do you make claims that have a good baseline? Uh, you're speaking to the, to the preaching of choir. Um, at Echoing Green, we have the same we have the same problem. Um, it's really hard to to find a benchmark against which to to measure impact. Um, if depending on I don't know what program area you're working in, but um, there's an organization called the Global Impact Investing Network, and they have a website um, called Iris. I can't remember what the acronym stands for right now, but essentially, um, impact investing is a really hot field right now in which um, people who maybe normally would have gone the VC route are going the social impact investing route. And this website has been set up to try to help you look at, you know, compare apples to oranges. Um, it's, it's set up to help you define what some common metrics are. I encourage everybody to look at this website. Um, it's really useful. Um, and that might be something for you to use, but it's something that is a challenge for Echoing Group as well, unfortunately. So finding benchmark data um, is a challenge too. Sorry, I can't give you a better answer there. I think um, also depends on how much money you want to spend on, on this, because um, you know I've seen people up kind of implement all kinds of uh, initial surveys and even in form of um, test questions, right? Can you add one plus one? Can you solve this equation? Can you do this? And they try to use that as a benchmark, right? What did the person know before we came in? Um, but I think it also goes into, again, how much money are you willing to spend on, on that? Hi, my name's Trent. Uh, thank you so much for your time. I'm a student at Rice University. Uh, working on uh, STEM education and uh, empowering the next science literate generation in the workforce. Um, similar to many uh, commitments here, uh, our commitment uh, exists through a lot of different university chapters, people um, you know, all over the country. How do you take all the different data, all the different sometimes varying initiatives that are under the same umbrella, but bring them together for streamlined, uh, meaningful uh, information? Yeah, so we're doing outreach in underprivileged schools, um, bringing uh, civic scientists and having them uh, talk, doing hands-on activities, experiments, and um, we're doing this uh, at many different, you know, through many different universities. We're looking at um, the attendance, the satisfaction, uh, different kinds of metrics that they provide about their experience from both the students and the teachers. That's what we're starting off, although we'd like to put more metrics there. But I guess there's some variance across the different kinds of chapters we have. So. Sure. Often you have to rely on the program implementers to categorize things for you. So um, our work on purpose program at Echoing Green, we have trainers going out and doing trainings all over the country in a similar kind of way. And they often tweak our model or our curriculum and we have to ask them to tell us um, in like let's say five categories what was the main focus of that. And then that way, in that way, we're then able to compare a little bit better apples to apples rather than trying on our end to guess what the focus was or guess what the primary um, you know, topic was and then piece it together later. That helps us a little bit with that problem. Um, hi, my name is Suiza. I'm also from Rice University. And uh, so my commitment is called Lady Metrics, and we basically invented a device that can be used to measure different 
uh, measurements of babies. And so um, we have several different uh, data points that we can collect that are both quantitative and qualitative. And so before we start collecting data, what are some considerations and steps we should take to make sure that the data we do collect is reliable and something that we can present to anyone who asks and have um, the, the support to back up that these numbers and facts and figures are all true? Well, I guess my first question is, what kind of information are you looking for about the babies? Because I think that might affect. Um, so the instrument is actually designed to be used by doctors. So it would be um, the qualitative aspect of it would be how convenient is it? How um, you know would how would they how often are they using it? Um, is it a portable enough size for them? Is it easy to use? And then again, there's a quantitative aspect to it because the whole point of this device is that. Um, hopefully, if you're using it, malnourishment in children will decrease, so we can look at malnourishment uh, figures and statistics that way. So there's a quantitative and qualitative aspect to it. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm thinking you might want to, you know, track this over time because I think it seems to be a time series kind of thing. You want to see what happens over time. Um, but also, you know, what's happening before they have your instrument in their hands? What, what numbers are out there that show what kind of experiences the doctors are having. And some of these things, I think, like we said, you can find even before um, before going to the community. So kind of general numbers, I would think, you know, whether it's the country or the region, and then, you know, if you can find that. And if it's not there, then, you know, then it's your challenge to kind of, of do that. And um, again, it goes back to the cost of, of doing that. Um, but I think you, you want to begin really early even before you, you um, provide your instrument because I think that will give a whole view of what you're trying to achieve over time, which I think for you is really important. But also the user experience, you say, right? So also making sure that the, the people who are, this instrument is being used on, right? How are they feeling about that? Yeah, I think it say maybe so. My kind of will be challenging, but um, you know, I think maybe doctors can help you with that. And you might have to go to the community to f find out what they, they think as well uh, on this aspect. This is where your advisors come in really handy. Um, you need a doctor on your advisor team. You need um, maybe a parent, uh, if, if this is again the advice that you use on children. Um, and they, if you envision where you want your data to be in the end, so if you want it in a peer reviewed journal, um, then those are the people you need to be talking to. to, to make sure you've got like, all your ducks in the row at the beginning. I think we have time for one or two last questions. Right here. Hi, I'm Sylvia, and I'm a statistics major at Harvard. And I actually have a question that's not related directly to my commitment, but I work for Oxfam in Haiti, and I have a question about data use, because a lot of times when I'm working with people on different projects, people I ask for like you know results and conclusions from something, and people basically just give me a numerical summary, and like that's the end point. You know, like 69 percent of people did this, and I guess I have trouble like teaching people or how to just explain that like that's not the end point, and like actually like critically thinking about the information that you collected and using that to like make better decisions in the future. And I'm wondering if you have any advice about how to kind of make that practice possible and common. So I think um, Muyambi's last slide can maybe have helped you with this. Um, you know, thinking through when you when you get to an endpoint with data and you have that, let's say, 69%, um, one of the things that you want to push them to do is, is to get to that information stage like we were talking about earlier. Um, and I think that in the beginning, you'll have to prompt some of those conversations and you'll have to say, okay, 69% of what? 69% means what? What was our target? What was our benchmark? How far are we from where we're looking to go? And once you, I've noticed with a lot of echoing green fellows, when they first start out, they also don't think like that. But after conversations and after some prompting, you can really start to change opinions. But um, in this idea of, of thinking through your data as an M&E report, um, when you look to like the findings, conclusions, and recommendation stages using some of that methodology. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think that's kind, I think that's where your reporting can 
summary kind of comes in handy because it's not just the numbers. It's 69%, but 69%, so what? And so what's happening to them? And it, there's a lot of, of questions there. And I think not many people are willing to ask the questions because sometimes it's about the good feel. You know, I feel good, we did 69% and it's all good and all that. But I think presenting that data and um, your findings and the report in a concise way um, is what can help with that because you're asking them questions about the, their data, right? So they have the numbers, but how are they affecting the whole project and the whole organization or the whole country at large? Or how is it going beyond your numbers, right? So. your project that's helping but what's happening what's the government doing in other communities what are people you know everything ties together so I like that and I think it's she gave you a perfect answer so I'd love it if you guys could just share a closing thought on something that you want to send the students home with so I talk to Echo and Green fellows and applicants all the time and a lot of, some of them are really focused on data and some of them aren't. Um, but regardless, they are contributing to social change uh, in the world. And I feel really passionate about the work they're doing regardless of how, whether or not they're measuring it. And I feel the same way about you guys. Um, you know, people who aren't measuring from the beginning often get there, uh, especially when they get extra help and extra staff or extra volunteers who have, are able to focus on that for them. Um, and so I just want to say that I'm so glad you all came here today to learn about this, um, and I hope that you put some resources and time towards it, um, but don't get discouraged if it's not your forte. Um, I can't speak fast so I can think, but I don't, know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I really thought about what to say. Anyway, um, I think the most important aspect of m and and the things that I don't want to admit is Sometimes I'm skeptical to spend the money, right? I want my money to go to the communities I'm working with. And, and so I struggled with it. But if you can implement it as you go on with your project, right? At the same time, don't wait um, for, for years to pass before you report these things, before you measure these things. I think that would be really useful to your project. So 
um, you know, but be conscious and, and, and do it well because it's just as important as anything um, your project has to offer. Please join me in doing that.